Since its dedication in 1998, the George S. Mickelson Trail has become one of South Dakota's most popular outdoor attractions. Running 109 miles through the very heart of the Black Hills, the trail attracts more than 60,000 users annually. But look back 15 years from that 1998 dedication. In 1983, the railroad operating on what would become the Mickelson Trail was about to abandon the line. The steel and ties would be pulled up as salvage, leaving nothing but mile after mile of an open but broken rail bed, and a lot of questions about who ought to take possession of what remained. Hikers, bicyclists, and others were using the path for recreation and entirely on their own. In 1983, landowners along the old line had reason to be excited about the maybes. Maybe they would soon own a part of the old right away, maybe they'd get some money for it, or maybe they'd get nothing. Everybody had to wait and see as the railroad, the federal government, and the state began the legal abandonment process. At the end of 1983, there was no satisfaction for anxious landowners, there was no railroad and there was no recreation trail. The rail corridor beneath what is now the Mickelson Trail was built by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad in 1890. That company would later merge with others to form the Burlington Northern. They came up from Nebraska, laying ties and track on a single out and back line connecting the Black Hills to their main network. They carved and blasted their way in the straightest practical line between Edgemont in the south and Deadwood in the north. But right in the center of the hills they were able to tap the mining and logging, not to mention a lot of the passengers that were coming from Denver, from Chicago and other areas via passenger service up to Deadwood in the northern hills. The line was built up and running in less than a year. At some point it became known as the High Line. The High Line, uh, the Mickelson Trail now, was kind of unique because it was the one that ran right through the center of the hills, right up the center. There was no denying that the Burlington wanted to get into the hills and they were gonna do it in a spectacular way. So if when you're riding or walking the trail these days, you can see a lot of the cuts and everything. And it's really unique up around Mystic in that area where the trestles and the cuts and everything else were literally blasted off of the hillsides. A trestle north of Edgemont presented a singular test for builders and for train men. When it was built, uh, it was the largest uh, one on the line. The first few years, the engineers and the conductors and the train crews would always talk about there was just a little bit of shake and a little bit when the wind was blowing. So the engineer or the conductor would sometimes actually get off the train and go ahead of it and just actually walk across the trestle and then they'd get on, back on the engine when they got across because they just were a little bit nervous of it. So about 10 years after it was built, they filled it in. And if you go down on the trail today, you can still see remnants of it underneath on the right of way. You can still see one of the old uh, timbers underneath the old uh, fill. But the glory days of the old High Line didn't last long. By the 1930s, with the advent of highways and automobiles, uh, the passenger business started fading away. There was still quite a bit of freight going um, between Edgemont and Deadwood. But by 1949, the uh, two remaining passenger trains, number 141 and 142, which were still steam powered at that time, were discontinued. But by the 1970s, most of the business was just going up to the Kirk Power Plant, just hauling coal up there for Black Hills Power and Light. By the time the last regularly scheduled train left Deadwood on November 8, 1983, State leaders in Pierre were already talking about the idea of a recreational trail. You know, at that point, it was just all just uh, a dream and, and wouldn't it be nice type of conversation, but it all started back there in 1983. In the early 1980s, when a railroad wanted to abandon a line, it had to go to the federal government through a process regulated by what was known as the Interstate Commerce Commission. So it was with the Burlington Northern. A 1983 amendment to the Federal National Trail System Act complicated the process, but it also appeared to pave the way for new rail-to-trail conversion projects. South Dakota had a chance to be among the first to put the new provision to the test. Well, at that point, the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, was asking the state if there was any interest in converting uh, the rail bed to a, a rail trail. 
and, and utilizing the conditions of the uh, Rail Trail Act, which basically said as an interim use, the railroad could be utilized for a trail purpose if there was a sponsor willing to really take on that responsibility. So a section of the National Trail Act looked like it would sanction a recreational trail on the old High Line. If that is, the state of South Dakota wanted to build it and preserve it intact for a best public use. Then Governor Bill Janklow said no. Of course, he was the one that was making the final decisions on behalf of the state because he was governor. And, and so we had provided the information as far as what was possible, what uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission's process was, and, and it's true. Uh, Governor Jankel thought that, uh, you know, it was a bit ahead of its time, and, and he really wasn't interested at that point. Hofer says that the near certainty of putting the state of South Dakota into a legal fight with landowners might also have factored into Janklow's decision. It was predictable that there was going to be some landowner objections both from the standpoint of, of, of possibly not being compensated for what they may be perceived as, a, as an ownership they had in the underlying rail bed, uh, and, and secondly, concerns about what the trail traffic might mean in terms of their privacy and that sort of thing. With the U.S. Forest Service in the hills also opposed to a trail at the time, the idea of a rail-to-trail conversion was set aside. It was not going to happen. Parts of the line are already destroyed, where tunnels and bridges have been removed. And the railroad continued its salvage operation. Out-of-state contractor John Trembath was hired to tear down the old trestles, and by 1986, he'd made good progress. That same year, then Rapid City Council President and former state legislator Guy Edwards bought mountain bikes for his wife and kids. Edward says his then-wife Cynthia and their son David were riding on the old rail bed when they happened to meet a man named Dick Lee, who was also out biking. The three of them come across John Trembath, and he's cutting down trestles, doing his job, and Cynthia and David come home that afternoon, late afternoon, and come running to me saying, hey, I got to go up there and stop this guy from cutting down these trestles. I go up and I talk to John Trembath, and I says, you know, what's the deal here? And he's got all kinds of stuff stacked up already because he's already cut down a lot of trussels. And uh, he says, well, I've got a contract with the Burlington Northern. And uh, I says, well, what's it worth? What are they paying you? Well, it's like $12,000. And I says, well, how about if I go get $12,000 and you stop cutting these down? And that's how it started. It was a wave of citizen support. Individuals gathered into groups like the Black Hills Rails to Trails Association. Public events on the trail got the attention of area media. It's a, a sad day when we have to let these bridges be torn down that could create one of the best recreation trails for South Dakota. As the trail movement gained momentum, those opposed to the trail put their own strategies into play. At the center were landowners who strongly argued that they had a legal claim to the land the railroad was abandoning. Now, naturally, they kind of thought their, their piece of heaven was going to be that 50 foot of right away all of a sudden, and that was going to be absorbed into their backyard. Or a rancher who might have had a, a mile or half mile of that trail was going to be absorbed in, and both sides of his pasture would meet, possibly if he had both sides, which was rare, but it, there are places like that. So there was naturally opposition, some of it in that case, extremely valid and very strong. But landowners also expressed concern about privacy issues, the possibility of trespassing, vandalism, and theft. The opposition pressured Black Hills businesses, and local government officials found themselves stuck in the middle. There was support within individuals in the town, but we couldn't really get anything from the mayors or the councils and stuff like that because the opposition was organizing boycotts. So we're going to boycott all your... Uh, your merchants in Custer. We're going to boycott all your merchants in Hill City if you support this trail. That was the kind of opposition there was. But then, trail backers gained a powerful friend in an important place. George Mickelson was elected governor in November 1986. And quite shortly after he was sworn in, in late January 1987, I'm sitting in George Mickelson's office and we're laying out a plan for the rail trail. 
I remember like it was yesterday, you know, walking into his office and hearing the passion and the uh, feelings that he had for this trail and how important it was to get it done. And, you know, it, it was a, a true belief on his part that the Mickelson Trail one day would be as important an asset to the Black Hills as some of the things that were done as a result of the vision of, of Norbeck, the establishment of Custer State Park, uh, Korjak with uh, the carving on, on Crazy Horse or, or Gutsum Borglum and his vision for Mount Rushmore. And, and, and he really was that far-sighted on this that he believed that this fell in that category. Not everyone agreed. Only a few months into Mickelson's term as governor, a group of people who owned land along the trail filed suit in circuit court. Court records say they weren't trying to stop the trail, but they were looking for compensation. By then, the rail conversion movement had found friends at the Burlington Northern. The railroad had transferred two pieces of land back to local ownership, and they were ready to hand over more. Guy Edwards says some transfers were only a signature away from completion when he was able to persuade rail executives to wait. The railroad voluntarily agreed to stop all the transfer of any deeded land they owned to everybody clamoring to get control of the piece of ground that was next to their property they owned. Then in 1991, the circuit court ruled against the landowners in the 1987 lawsuit. They appealed their case to the South Dakota Supreme Court. But by 1991, work on a portion of the trail was already complete. Governor Mickelson, Guy Edwards, Dick Lee, and others celebrated the opening of a six-mile stretch of what was called the Burlington Northern Heritage Trail. Five years ago, Guy and I had a dream. We imagined that we could save this old railroad bed and make it a permanent part of the way people could enjoy the Black Hill. This has been a, a long project and one we're very proud of. Welcome to the dedication of the, of the uh, Black Hills Rail to Trails project. We hope that this project will be a source of pride for all of us and possibly for future generations of South Dakota. Uh, at the risk of uh, not being a particularly a good philosopher, uh, I couldn't help but think also as I drove up from Custer State Park uh, today to be here about people like Dick mentioned uh, he and Guy Edwards had a vision and a dream uh, for this which I predict at some time in our lifetime is going to be one of the most significant recreational opportunities that we have of a different kind in the Black Hills. Mickelson expressed his view of the ongoing legal fight with trail opponents. I think it is also appropriate to, uh, to understand that I know and everybody else knows that there are those that oppose this trail. For some that oppose it, it is a deeply personal issue uh, rising largely out of their own love for the Black Hills and the pleasure they take in the land that they know best. Such treasures are jealously guarded, particularly when faced with the uncertainty of change. Ironically, trail supporters share the same values I share the same value, though it may be a small consolation for opponents. Treasures held in common are the ones that are most generally protected, and I firmly believe that this trail will help to protect the quality of the land that we hold so dear. We will continue to work with the adjacent landowners to hear their concerns and to propose solutions so that we can work it out. We will meet with each of them before the trail is constructed, adjoining their property, keeping them apprised of our plan. It may be impossible to persuade everyone to share our vision, and I certainly have um, no grandiose ideas about 100% consensus, but we hope that we can be good neighbors and demonstrate good stewardship, and we can encourage adjoining landowners to accept the trail and perhaps even become partners in its improvement. Less than a year later, in 1992, the state Supreme Court handed down its ruling on the landowner's appeal. Our South Dakota Supreme Court ruled that abandonment had not taken place, therefore the right-of-way was still and could be retained for a public purpose. Burlington Northern donated, in the end, donated 
all the land they owned. And anything not owned was still retained in an easement format, all ruled by the South Dakota Supreme Court as a continuation of a corridor, and the state then becomes the new owner versus the Burlington Northern. It looked like the way forward was clear. Work on the trail was to continue in three phases, from Deadwood to Hill City, Hill City to Custer, and finally Custer to Edgemont. The governor, along with but long before the work was done, on April 19, 1993, Governor George S. Mickelson was killed along with seven others in a plane crash near Dubuque, Iowa. Lieutenant Governor Walter Dale Miller took over for Mickelson and served as governor until the 1994 election, when voters sent Bill Janklow back to the governor's office. When Governor Janklow was faced with the decision as far as how do we complete the trail, how do we put together the remaining funding, um, he really rolled up his sleeves and, and really took uh, ownership in, in that part of the decision that had to be made. Janklow insisted that the 10-year trail plan be done in five. Whatever his ideas about the trail were in 1983, there was no questioning Janklow's resolve after 1995. And if it wouldn't have been for his support at that point and, and his commitment to the project, uh, we wouldn't have been able to complete the project in 1998, as, as, it, as it turned out was the case. So uh, he, he ended up becoming a, a great supporter of the project. Guy Edwards doesn't dispute Janklow's supporting role in finishing up the trail, but he mainly credits the many private citizens who chose to embrace the cause. In the hundreds that signed petitions and got involved and raised money. So the trail was a Black Hills, actually a South Dakota project, because we had people from all over South Dakota supporting the trail. And it was, that's what kept us going. And they, the state of South Dakota, the people of this state saw this trail as we did, and that's what caused it to happen. Forest service workers, National Guard troops, prison trustees, and many, many volunteers contributed an estimated 56,000 hours of work. Low to no cost engineering expertise, trail and bridge building work, and much more. The state legislature also took action. The legislature uh, passed a, a bill that basically put the requirement on the state, Game Fish and Parks, to build a fence along to buffer or protect uh, the adjoining private landowner from the public right-of-way uh, and build a fence that was agreeable to the landowner. When the trail was done, and just barely, supporters staged a three-day ride on the entire length of the trail to celebrate. Ceremonies were held and speeches were heard in towns from Deadwood to Edgemont. I think having this trail bear the Mickelson name is a distinction and a privilege. And George would be so honored, just as we are. When describing this trail, my dad once said, the whole idea is to save a part of our history, a part of our outdoors that we value so much in our state and make it available for everyone to enjoy. With the completion of this trail and the continued use for years to come, I believe that this goal has been met. All of the work, all of the effort that's gone into this doesn't mean a single thing if it isn't used, used on a continuous basis by guests that come to South Dakota, but more importantly, used by the people who live in this state and who call South Dakota home. One of the reasons a powerful lot of people choose to continue to live in South Dakota is because we have resources like this. There's no way we could have funded all this stuff with the government. It took the cooperation, like I said, of the Defense Department through the Army National Guard. It took the effort of the Game, Fish, and Parks Department of the State of South Dakota. It took the cooperation and the effort of the Forest Service of the United States Department of Agriculture. It took the leadership and the wisdom and the drive of George Mickelson to decide to start to turn it into a reality. And in the final analysis, it was done because of you and an awful lot of people like you dug into your pockets, raised the money, made the political pushes that had to be made, made the arguments that had to be made, and raised the funding that was necessary to see that the match was done. Today's picnic, today's dedication is a tribute to George Mickelson and the Mickelson family, but it's also a tribute to every one of you people who had a role just like George Mickelson had to play and sing to, the, the, sing to it that this becomes a reality today.
By 1998, about $5 million had been spent on the trail. 600,000 of that came from private donations. We are doing a variety of things, such as uh, the volunteer work on the bridges. We are selling uh, bridge decking. Businessman Dave Snyder was involved early in the project, donating time and money and bringing others into the trail building effort. Snyder led the first of the annual three-day bike rides now known as the Mickelson Trail Trek. He's ridden it every year since, 16 times as of 2013. So it's very gratifying to see that um, what it's become, and it's one of the top trails in the, I think it was voted in the top 10 in the world or something, but it is a, a very, very uh, highly rated trail. It's a tremendous asset to South Dakota, and it brings a lot of visitors, and the people that ride the trail uh, generally are fairly affluent and they spend money, so it has an economic impact. The energy of people on riding on bike trails is very positive. When I was involved at the, at the beginning, when there was a lot of opposition to it, it was, uh, you know, there's a lot of fear that this would be a negative influence, but bikers are not that way. And it's been very, it's been very positive. What it is today is what we, th we thought it would be. And the trail is still getting better and better every year. The story of the Mickelson Trail is far from over, so it's not really possible to say how things turned out. It is possible to ask whether or not at this point the trail has lived up to its promise. I think it has, and I think it has exceeded a lot of people's expectations as to what they thought it was going to be originally. Conservatively speaking, as far as annual trail use during the summer months, we look at about 60,000 during the summer, and that's conservative. Trailbackers said it would provide a boost to existing businesses. Frontier Photo has been thriving in Custer for over 20 years. They started renting bikes just a few years ago as a service to tourists. And to get them in the store. Okay, now it works full circle. I get people in here and they look around and they say, oh, you rent bicycles. So it's kind of a full circle thing. But yes, we would be, we would be fine. It's just um, a supplement to uh, our business. The trail was also supposed to attract new businesses, and it has. Joey and Eddie Bonds owned a bike shop in Arizona, but about 10 years ago, they bought a bike shop in Hill City. For us, it's the thing. It, it, that's it. We cater to the Mickelson Trail. I mean, that's 99% that's of our business is on the trail. And if it wasn't here, we probably would have ended up either in Moab, Utah, or Bridgeport, California, because we were looking for a second location regardless. The Mickelson Trail was supposed to improve the quality of life in Black Hills communities. The Mickelson Trail adds a lot to Custer. It cuts right through town and gives people um, opportunities within town for nice places to walk, safe places to walk their dog or get some exercise, and it brings a lot of visitors to Custer. The trail was also going to be a four-season attraction, and it is. Game fish and parks facilitate snowshoe hikes and other activities. A winter carnival and lead features dog sled rides. And the Mickelson connects Deadwood and lead to the greater Black Hills snowmobile trail system farther south. Winter is the only time, and this section is the only portion of the Mickelson trail ever open to motor vehicles. The convenience is, is to be able to drive the trails and then be able to come in, to and from you know, the motels in, in town because otherwise you'd have to load and haul them and it's quite inconvenient. As for the vandalism, theft and privacy issues landowners adjacent to the trail worried about? That of course hasn't proved to be an issue, it's just not. Bikers and hikers that are out in the outdoors are clean, friendly, they're um, responsible people that are going to take care of the trail. They pick up after themselves. Um, there's very, very little graffiti anywhere along the trail. We have very, very little vandalism. We actually have people call us and tell us when there's issues on the trailer. If they see something that they don't like, they will call us and tell us so that we can get out there right away and fix whatever problem there is. South Dakota Game Fish and Parks officials say there shouldn't be problems anywhere along the trail if all trail users remember to follow the rules. Anybody who buys a pass or uses a trailhead would see them. Trail rules are also meant to minimize conflicts among the ever-growing number of trail users. The rules establish right-of-way, 
bicyclists are supposed to give way to people walking and everyone is supposed to yield to horses and mules. And equine use has always been a part of the Mickelson Trail's multi-use mission. Doug Beshin is part of an equine group trying to foster good relations between all trail users. He says he's never heard of any serious problems between riders on horseback and other trail users, but he recognizes that the potential is there. As the population grows and the Mickelson uh, is used more and more and more, uh, that could happen. We just need to let everybody know that we have to yield to livestock uh, equine out there. The answer, Beshin says, is education for all trail users. And he says his group wants to set up a workshop to get the word out. We're going to throw everybody together for a day. Uh, they'll get to learn quirks about horses. We'll get to learn quirks about mountain bikes. The long-term cost of maintaining the trail presents another challenge. Paying for bridge maintenance is a particular concern. A non-governmental foundation working with the state does what it can to continue that kind of public commitment. We're currently raising funds for repair of the bridges on the Nicholson Trail. Um, each one costs about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to uh, renovate, and we're trying to do two or three a year. But right now, we have about sixty bridges that we're currently on our list for repairs. Plans for more bike trails in and around the Black Hills are still being drawn up. A new path linking the Mickelson Trail to Mount Rushmore is in the works, and there's talk of paving some of the trail to make it more handicapped accessible. But there might be a major bump in the road ahead. On March 10, 2014, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of a Wyoming landowner with an abandoned railroad right-of-way on his family's property. The U.S. Forest Service was going to continue an existing bike trail on that right-of-way, but the court ruled 8 to 1 that the land is not the government's to use. Justice Sonia Sotomayor was the lone dissenter in the decision. In her opinion, the ruling undermines the legality of thousands of miles of former rights-of-way that the public now enjoys as means of transportation and recreation and lawsuits challenging the conversion of former rails to recreational trails alone may well cost American taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> what the ruling will mean for rail-to-trail projects in South Dakota and other states remains to be seen, but it could be the start of a new chapter in the ongoing story of the Mickelson Trail. compared to putting together a puzzle. Until a puzzle is complete, the focus is on all of the pieces, each and every piece. But once the, pu once the puzzle is completed, the focus of all the pieces fades away. You do not see the pieces, you see the final project. And so I think it's fitting that for all of us, all of us that are pieces in this project, that it's time for us to fade away and that this trail now becomes the focus, the final picture. And it is probably symbolic, correctly so, that we ended our ride at mile zero. And that should be the start of the focus on this trail itself. Thank you. up to Deadwood in the Northern Hills. The line was built up and running in less than a year. At some point, it became known as the High Line. The High Line, uh, the Mickelson Trail now, was kind of unique because it was the one that ran right through the center of the hills, right up the center. There was no denying that the Burlington wanted to get into the hills and they were gonna do it in a spectacular way. So if, when you're riding or walking the trail these days, you can see a lot of the cuts and everything and it's really unique up around Mystic in that area where the trestles. Now the Mickelson Trail was built by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad in 1890. That company would later merge with others to form the Burlington Northern. They came up from Nebraska, laying ties and track on a single out-and-back line connecting the Black Hills to their main network.
They carved and blasted their way in the straightest practical line between Edgemont in the south and Deadwood in the north. But right in the center of the hills, they were able to tap the mining and logging, not to mention a lot of the passengers that were coming from Denver, from Chicago and other areas via passenger service. Owners along the old line had reason to be excited about the maybes. Maybe they would soon own a part of the old right away. Maybe they'd get some money for it, or maybe they'd get nothing. Everybody had to wait and see as the railroad, the federal government, and the state began the legal abandonment process. At the end of 1983, there was no satisfaction for anxious landowners. There was no railroad, and there was no recreation trail. The rail corridor beneath what is ours annually. But look back 15 years from that 1998 dedication. In 1983, the railroad operating on what would become the Mickelson Trail was about to abandon the line. The steel and ties would be pulled up as salvage, leaving nothing but mile after mile of an open but broken rail bed, and a lot of questions about who ought to take possession of what remained. Hikers, bicyclists, and others were using the path for recreation and entirely on their own. In 1983, landowners Since its dedication in 1998, the George S. Mickelson Trail has become one of South Dakota's most popular outdoor attractions. Running 109 miles through the very heart of the Black Hills, the trail attracts more than 60,000 users.